Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today, we're going to do a brief history of microbiology. We're going to talk about how, they, how microbes were first discovered, how we first learned that they were able to harm us, how we first discovered where they actually came from, and how we now classify them. So stay tuned for this really quick history of microbiology. So today we're going to go through a brief history of microbiology. So to start this conversation, let's get in our way back machines and go back to the 1600s and meet arguably the most accomplished scientist that you've never heard of, heard of a gentleman by the name of Robert Hooke. So Robert Hooke was an old school scientist. He was a genius by all accounts and did not specialize in any one particular field of science, but was a scientist sort of at large. To give you a few examples, Robert Hooke discovered uh, several of the gas laws. If you've heard of Boyle's gas laws, he worked with Boyle to help found those. He discovered, or he first studied the properties of refraction, i.e. was talking about the wave properties of light 200 years before anybody else was. He, he established the laws of elasticity. In other words, how do springs work? Um, he actually studied several different gravitational principles. And in fact, actually laid claim to some of the things that Isaac Newton uh, would later claim as his own uh, in, cal in, his, in Newton's calculus. We'll get back to that because that kind of made Newton mad and that's going to be relevant here in just a few minutes. But one of the other things that Robert Hooke actually did was he was a very popular scientist at that time. You could think of him as arguably one of the most popular scientists of his era. And when he studied something, when he wrote something, people sat up and paid attention. So why is he relevant to our conversation on microbiology? Well, a lot of people go around tend to think that Robert Hooke invented the microscope. He didn't. The microscope was invented several years before him. However, he was the first person to popularize its use. So when Robert Hooke took a microscope and started studying things under his microscope, the things that we can't see with our naked eye, he ended up writing a book called Micrographia that he published. It was an international bestseller. People wanted to know what Robert Hooke was studying. They examined this and it sort of entered into and ushered in this sort of age of microscopy. If Robert Hooke was studying it, then everybody else wanted to as well. Now, Robert Hooke did give us one very important thing in terms of the world of microbiology. When he looked at cork samples under a microscope, basically plant cells, what he observed is that they were sort of rectangular and because his microscope wasn't super powerful, he wasn't able to see the things that were happening inside of those cells. He didn't see any of the intracellular structures. Instead, what he basically saw was the cell wall and some stuff on the inside. And he thought to himself, boy, uh, these look like the, the sparse sort of rectangular rooms in which monks live that they refer to as cells. So Robert Hooke uh, is actually the person that gave us the term cell. Okay, and that's what stuck. He published Micrographia and then he moved on to other things. Now, why have you never heard of Robert Hooke if he did all of these wonderful things, made all these discoveries, was also the first head of the Royal Society of London? Well, the answer is simple. At one point in his career, he was not known for being a particularly easy to get along with guy. And at one point, he basically, picture Isaac Newton as sort of a new up and coming scientist. Isaac Newton was going to publish his calculus to discuss the, the gravitational principles for which he's known. And Robert Hooke said, no, no, I've already discovered all these and I'm publishing a book on this and made Newton wait and made Newton wait. And eventually uh, Newton just got tired of waiting, didn't believe that Hooke had ever actually discovered these things, but was just trying to sort of steal his thunder, publish his calculus. Newton never really forgave Hooke for holding back his working, and making it difficult for him to, to publish. Um, for what it's worth, Hooke really never seemed to forgive Newton either, and they had this big feud. So what happens is this. Robert Hooke dies in, I think, 1705, and Sir Isaac Newton comes along. He becomes the second head of the Royal Society of London, and to get his final revenge, orders all portraits, all busts, all anything that had to do with Robert Hooke destroyed. So, you know, note to self, don't make Isaac Newton mad because he will destroy all effigies of you. And that's why this picture has a question mark next to it that says Robert Hooke. And the reason why is because we don't actually know what Robert Hooke looks like. It's kind of crazy, right? Newton actually ordered all of Robert Hooke's works to be burned as well. Uh, seemed a bit spiteful to me. Uh, but fortunately, some of uh, Robert Hooke's friends uh, buried it outside in a yard. And it was later discovered in the 1800s. So we do have all of his works. We still don't know what he actually looked like. 
So that's where we get the term cell. And, and Robert Hooke really made micro, microscopy popular. Lots of other people went out and said, hey, I should start looking at microscopes too. So one of those people that actually decided to start looking at things under a microscope was a man named Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. Now van Leeuwenhoek um, is known as the grandfather of microbiology, okay? So van Leeuwenhoek, um, he invented some of these crazy microscopes. You can see them here. They do not look like the traditional microscope. But what was interesting is he learned uh, from a friend of his how to bend glass. His microscopes, despite being very non-conventional in terms of how they look, were much more powerful than most of the microscopes going around the world. So Anthony von Leeuwenhoek was actually able to see things that Robert Hooke and a lot of other people couldn't under sort of their less powerful microscopes. And Anthony van Leeuwenhoek studied pretty much anything he could under the microscope. He looked at spermatozoa. He looked at tissue, uh, tissue fibers. He looked at the gunk between his teeth. And picture that, 1700s, 1600s, uh, what was trapped in people's teeth before toothbrushes were invented is just ghastly, if you think about it. But what Anthony van Leeuwenhoek realized and brought to the attention of the world through several of his publications was that microbes are everywhere. It didn't matter what surface or body part or body fluid you sampled. Everything was teeming with this microscopic life. And what is really interesting about Anthony van Leeuwenhoek is this. You would expect someone who is now known as the grandfather of an entire field of science that made all of these wonderful discoveries and super popularized microbiology and had correspondence with Robert Hooke would have gone to the best universities in Europe and so on and so forth. And in fact, he did not. His professional training was as a drapist. He made curtains. That's what he did for a living. It turns out that microscopy and looking at microbes was a hobby of his. He was just loosely interested in science and this is what he did for fun. Could you imagine being so good at something that you do for fun, that your hobby, that you get to interact with the top scientists in the world who are interested in what you do? I mean, that'd be like tinkering around with computer programs and having an email, an ongoing email correspondence with Bill Gates. I mean, that is what happened with Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek, who was just an incredible uh, story in the world of science. But one of the things that Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek brought forward, and it caused the rest of the scientific community to acknowledge, is microbes were everywhere. But what's really interesting is even though we recognize that microbes were everywhere at this point, nobody ever thought at that time that they actually had the ability to impact human beings. Nobody ever thought that something so small could impact anything real. They were just these invisible little things that were around. In fact, there was a huge debate about where they came from in the first place. About half of the scientific community was on one side of the argument known as abiogenesis. And abiogenesis also went by another name, spontaneous generation. These are people that would argue that maggots spontaneously arose out of meat. They just came from these vital forces, and that's how life was made. Rats would come out of trash just from the vital forces that were accumulated as these things degraded, and they would form new life. Then you have the biogenesists, who believe that life could only come from something of the same type, i.e. baby humans only came from humans, and baby rats only came from adult rats, and bacteria only came from existing bacteria. And you may think this is a crazy argument to be having because we live in the present, but back then you had some very respected scientists on both sides of this argument. And for the large part, throughout the 1700s and the early to mid 1800s, this was an ongoing debate about whether, like, where life came from uh, with respected scientists on both sides. Fast forward to the mid 1800s. Right in the middle of the American Civil War, you have a French scientist named Louis Pasteur, who through one of the most elegant scientific studies of all time, proved the biogenesists right, destroyed the theory of spontaneous generation. So what he did was this. It's what's known as the swan neck flask experiments. He did something really neat. He took something that was basically the equivalent of chicken broth, proteins, sugars, mixed it all up, boiled it to make sure that there was nothing alive in there, and then bent the end of the flasks over so that nothing could get into the flasks. Half of the flasks, he actually broke the necks off of. And by breaking the necks off, he then exposed what was inside of, what he basically exposed the, the nutrient broth or the, the, the chicken broth to the environment. And lo and behold, what he discovered is in the subset of flasks where the neck was left intact and not broken, nothing ever grew. They remained sterile. 
in the flasks that were exposed to the environment, that's where he saw microbial growth. Those are the ones that became contaminated. In one elegant experiment, Louis Pasteur proved to the world that life could only come from existing life, that nothing could ever just appear out of nowhere, at least not under modern conditions, and that the abiogenesists, the spontaneous generationists, they were wrong. They were out. Okay? Now, the one thing I will say is this. There's a little caveat to this. Louis Pasteur's experiment applies to the modern world. It applies to the Earth as we know it today. Go back 4.2 billion years, 4.6 billion years to the beginning of Earth. Could life have spontaneously arose through abiogenesis? Sure. And in fact, it must have at some point. But under modern conditions, under the way Earth exists now with its oxidizing environment and so on and so forth, and the fact that life exists already precludes new life from being generated through abiogenesis. It's just what we know now. Baby humans come from humans. Baby rats come from adult rats. So on and so forth. Same thing from bacteria. Okay? Louis Pasteur would also go on to discover ways of pasteurizing, of sterilizing things like beer and other fluids. And he would also be one of the first people to discover that microbes could actually harm human beings. He was able to discover that, for example, cavities or dental caries are caused by microbes. But there was a lot of other arguments and a lot of other discoveries that were made in the meantime. So, for example, we had some American scientists, okay, that uh, in particular, uh, one named Oliver Wendell Holmes was a surgeon during the Civil War. One of the things he realized was that the majority of patients who died during the battle, during the Civil War battles, they didn't die from losing a leg or being hit by a bullet. They died from the resulting infection that was caused when the body was opened up by these wounds or when they were, uh, or following post-operation treatments. So, you know, having legs amputated and stitched up and things and so on and so forth. At the same time, you also have him noticing that women who gave birth in hospitals were much more likely to develop infections than women that were able to give birth at home. Now, again, I think we have to put some historical context into play here. Am I saying that nowadays you should give birth at home versus at a hospital? No. What I'm saying is, is you should not give birth in a 19th century American hospital that had no concept of things like aseptic technique or germ theory. Because back then, who went to hospitals? Sick people. And the same doctors that were treating the sick people weren't doing anything to remove the contamination from their hands before they went and delivered a baby. Over in Europe, you have a... Uh, you, you have a, a surgeon named Ignaz Semmelweis who discovered the same thing. He discovered that, for example, people who were doing autopsies in morgues would then go over and deliver a baby with no hand washing or anything because that wasn't a thing at this time, were more likely to cause sickness in the mothers who were giving birth. I know that seems shocking, but like people ignored him back then. He was, he was basically chastised and chased out of two different hospitals for deploying hand-washing techniques that were proven to work at the time that he was there. But they didn't like him because there was really no establishment until that, that microbes could cause disease until Pasteur came along. By the end of the 1800s, we have surgeons such as Joseph Lister who are pioneering aseptic techniques, realizing that we must clean surgical instruments between uses. We must wash our hands prior to, to in using, in using you know, disinfectants to make sure that we're not contaminating our patients. But it was a slow, arduous process from first discovering that these things existed to acknowledging where they came from, to learning how to kill them, to understanding that without killing them, they can harm us and that they're all around us and they can cause sickness in people. Now, what's interesting is after we get the discovery by Darwin, after we get the, we get the evolutionary theory, theory of Darwin in the mid to late 1800s, there becomes this new sort of, of way of sort of, we've got all these microbes, how do we classify them? So we've got uh, you know, a nomenclature system put in place, but it wasn't until we have Darwin and his theory of evolution that we begin to understand that maybe the reason certain things look the way they do, the similarities between them, are not just sheer accident. They're the result of evolutionary relatedness, right? So there's this new motion for this, this new movement in the world of biological classification and taxonomy that takes place towards the end of the 19th century. And one of the hard things to figure out at that point was what do we do with these microscopic organisms? So to start, we have these, these two basic systems of animals and plants. Okay, 
So we've got animals and we've got plants. Where do the bacteria fall into play? Well, the answer is the, the solution at that time was to sort of lump them all together into this weird united group that was called the Monera. Okay, so you had plants and animals. You have the Monera, which is basically all the microscopic things. Okay, you had protists, which were sort of unicellular eukaryotes. And then you had fungi. And believe it or not, fungi wasn't considered to be its own kingdom until like 1950 through the work of, of Robert Whittaker, who was like, uh, fungi aren't plants or animals. They deserve their own kingdom. That's a crazy story for a different day. But one of the things we knew about the Monera is they weren't the same. We knew the Monera weren't the same because of their structural differences, the way they lived, and their metabolism. You've got this one group of Monera that has cell walls that are made out of peptidoglycan. They live in relatively normal parts of the earth. Their metabolism is very similar to that found in eukaryotes, you know, things like lycolysis and the citric acid cycle and so on and so forth. And then you've got this other group that is shaped differently. A lot of them lack cell walls. If they have a cell wall, it's made out of branched hydrocarbons uh, or pseudopeptidoglycan. They live in weird places like thermal vents at the bottom of the ocean in the acid runoff from defunct mines. Their metabolism produces things like hydrogen sulfide, just all kinds of weirdness. But nobody really wanted to get too far into it, right? Um, they're, they're small, they're microscopic, lump them together. That was until Carl Wolves and George Fox came along. And Carl Wolves and George Fox uh, picked up on a new technology that came out in the 70s. It was called DNA sequencing. In the 1970s, the technology was there to be able to sequence the A's, C's, G's, and T's found in the genes of all living things. And this is particularly interesting. Because we go back to our argument about taxonomy, right? We go back to the fact that things that look most similar, things that have the most things in common, likely have those commonalities because they're very closely related. And because all living things, all the things that look alike, behave alike, act alike, all that's encoded in their DNA, it's a pretty logical assumption to make that things that are most similar would also have very similar genes, very similar DNA sequences, because they're so closely related, right? Well, this is what they did. They studied something called 16S ribosomal RNA. And the reason why this was interesting to them was because 16S ribosomal RNA genes don't change that much. They change very slowly over time. They're highly conserved. So if you see a big difference in the genes that encode 16S ribosomal RNA, it's pretty safe to assume that those big differences are the result of a large gap in evolutionary like relatedness. In other words, they've been separated as a species for a very long time. If you see very little differences, it's pretty safe to assume that those species are very closely related with respect to evolutionary time. So what they did was they took this kingdom Monera and they took this group over here with the normal metabolism and normal places to live and peptidoglycan cell walls and so on and so forth. Took some of these guys and sequenced their 16S ribosomal RNA. And they took some of these oddballs over here with their pseudopeptidoglycan and, and you know weird places to live and weird metabolisms and sequenced their 16S ribosomal RNA. And here's the interesting discovery. All of these guys with the normal metabolism and the peptidoglycan and what we now know as bacteria, all of these guys were very closely related. Their 16S ribosomal sequences were nearly identical, and they represented a true cluster of, of evolutionary relatedness. But when you compared the 16S ribosomal RNA genes from these guys to these guys, they were massively different. These guys were all very closely related to each other, but not even remotely closely related to bacteria. So what they argued is we don't need a five kingdom system. We need a three domain system. We need one domain of bacteria the domain bacteria. These guys are prokaryotic, but they represent one sort of united branch of life. These other weirdos over here, this other group that used to be known as Monera, they're a separate domain of life, a separate branch that they refer to as the archaea. But here's the crazy part. Once they'd established that bacteria and archaea were separate branches of life, there was a third branch that they had not investigated. The eukaryotes, the plants, the animals, the fungi, the protists. And when they sequenced the 16S ribosomal RNA genes for eukaryotes, they made an, a very, very interesting discovery. Archaea, based on this, and based on a lot of other features we now know, are significantly more closely related to eukaryotes than they are to bacteria. In other words, 
the archaea, these weird things that produce hydrogen sulfide gas and live in the acid runoff from mines in the bottom of the ocean and have weird wonky metabolisms, they're our closer relatives. They're clo more closely related to us than bacteria. Despite the fact that they look so similar, archaea are closer evolutionary relatives to us and all other eukaryotes than they are to any bacterial species, which is a pretty crazy and exciting discovery to make. Um, but that's what we have now. We now have the three domain structure of life with two prokaryotic branches, bacteria and archaea, and one eukaryotic branch that comprises four kingdoms of life, plants, animals, fungi, and protists. So that's a somewhat brief history of microbiology. I hope you guys uh, learned a lot today um, and we'll continue our conversation about microbiology another day. Thank you so much for tuning in and I really look forward to seeing you guys soon. Thanks. Thanks.